Hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 135 with moi, your host Agostino, not moi, but moi, your host Agostino Zinga, what's going on, what's happening? Hope you guys are feeling great, well hydrated, well rested and all that malarkey, it's the start of the week man, it's Christmas Eve bitches, for all you guys and girls that like to celebrate this fake pagan holiday that is Christmas. Congratulations, you've made it. For those of us that don't care, we're grown ups and we don't celebrate these um, stupid celebrations of a fictional character that's meant to get birthed in some type of year, whatever it is, and we celebrate by giving each other material gifts. For those of us who are grown up, it's just another day, just another Monday, and here we are. Happy to have you within my presence, listening to my soothing voice. <sighs> said no one ever but you know what you gotta say these things to yourself because sometimes you manifest it and some people might say it back to you but regardless of that how you doing how you feeling (sighs) i'm doing fine thanks for asking man i'm pretty good i'm pretty bloody good i am in a good place as per usual mondays for me are just another day i love mondays i love tuesdays wednesdays thursdays fridays saturdays and sundays i don't have one of those kind of um this positions that um, makes me wake up and think, oh man, I've got to go work. Today's Monday. <laughs> nah, I don't have that. I'm a grown up. I get on with things. Um, each day to to me is a gift. Uh, it's a reward, you know, because from where I'm from, you don't make it. Uh, you don't make it up until you're 17. You know, you won't make it out of the hood until you're 17, man. All that bullshit people talk about, but no. But seriously, um, I've I've always kind of been like that. I, I've not. I've never really taken um the whole. Uh, day thing idea and and if anything as well i think it's just another i think if i was that guy i'll start to question my life choices i think once you hit that wall where you start um bemoaning what day of the week it is i think you've hit a bit of a wall in terms of um, your life overall and you have to maybe take a look um uh take a look at yourself take stock of what's going on maybe make some adjustments in terms of maybe you're working too much in terms of maybe the job you're doing you're not be you're not feeling fulfilled you're not feeling that you're being um uh what you get rewarded for your hard work you haven't maybe got a promotion in a long time you don't get acknowledged for the, the hours you put in blah 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 there might be loads of umpteenth reasons why but i think the moment you wake up and you start bemoaning what day of the week it is and you start hope hoping and wishing for the weekend i think you're on a on a steep learning a steep slope towards inevitable failure that's just my opinion okay i'm a nobody you don't have to listen to what i have to say i'm just sharing my opinion because you know that's the nature of my podcast you talk and you repeat certain things um ad nauseum uh speaking into a usb microphone and uploading them onto various uh video and audio um hosting platforms in the hope that other people will too feel the need to connect with you and what you say but yeah here we are man it's a good good old day in it it's nice and sunny today actually not as cold as it has been the last couple of weeks um i have come back from the gym as per usual i had like a six day run last week i didn't do seven i was meant to do um i had one day off on the sunday which is yesterday but then i just come back from the gym i did like a little hour session um, of like you know standard weights training stuff and then i did a, an interesting one today where i did a free 400 meter free free 400 meters on the rowing machine and then i did a 10 kettlebells or 15 kettlebell swings and then i did like 60 um double unders on the skipping rope so i'm feeling pretty um brutalized today my arms are all sore and stuff my calves and stuff are all sore as well actually i'm going to move this a little bit down see if i can reduce slightly down here yeah my arm my arms are slightly sore as well i'm just feeling a little bit tender at the moment but you know that's all part of nature of working out too tough but i think this week because of the christmas festivities i'm going to be heading over to my uh parents house tomorrow for food and all that malarkey so i think i'm gonna um continue uh working out i think for the seven days work out all the way through the week just so i can give myself a good base so if i do end up getting a bit crazy tomorrow which will probably be the other day i will get a bit crazy and gluttonous and maybe tonight too i think we might make some homemade pieces but um i'm gonna circumvent some of the effects by doing some intermittent fasting which i've been doing for i did it for five days last week i fasted for about 16 hours i think i, I did do a couple 20 hour shifts which was quite cool but i think i'm gonna work out there throughout the entire week and the days i am going to be eating shit i'm going to make sure that i kind of uh have basically one meal at one meal that day and then fast for the rest of the day and then continue kind of working out and making sure that i'm on a good little level so when we head into 
the periods where you should be eating kind of leftovers and loads of carby foods i'm not going to be just i'm not going to be likely to do that because i'm going to be working out i don't want to you know lose the effects of working out just by um pillaging or stuffing flipping cakes into my face might not be a good idea that especially for the waistline might be a good idea and also it's a good way to start the beginning of the year and of the new year kind of get started on the front foot um none of this kind of like waiting until the first of the month and then starting new things are fresh you start from now and then you kind of roll into the new year with good habits and a bit of momentum you kind of use that momentum to your advantage you know and then just kind of you know gently roll into the new year roly 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 poly Anyway, apart from that, this weekend has been so cool, so amazing, so fun. Uh, number one, DJ on Friday, which was amazing as per usual. Always a good time to DJ on a Friday. Kind of a lot of people out, but it kind of like thinned out at, towards the end. About 10, it got a bit empty. Not many people left around there, but still nice to play for the people that were there. So thanks to everyone that was there. That was very enjoyable. I'm able to play some music, have a good time, drink some beer, hang out with the bar, with the bar staff, and then go home. Perfecto. Then the Saturday, cherry on the cherry on top of the cake. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's first game as caretaker manager for Manchester United, and we won 5-1. 5 1. Five. We scored five goals. Manchester United scored five goals. You know what? I don't even recognize that penalty because um we didn't ha- we didn't we weren't really under threat. Cardiff were pretty shit, so I'm not gonna, you know, gloat too hard about the result. So it effectively it probably was a five nil, but you know, there's still some things we need to iron out in terms of our defence. But we won five. We won by five goals playing attacking football on the front foot, quick one two passes all around the box, uh triangles everywhere. Our attacking players running around the pitch with freedom. Uh, some of our attacking lineup, especially like Martial, hugging that left hand side of the pitch and absolutely terrorizing the right back of for Cardiff. Like it was so, it was night and day. It was amazing to see. I think we all kind of expected to have a little bit of a manager bump, right? New manager bump comes in. Everyone's kind of trying really hard um, to kind of uh, put in effort and stuff. Like we see that quite often happens with new manager coming to teams. But I didn't think we'd have that much of a difference in terms of our attacking intent with having Oliver Gunn and Soul Shark there. But I think thinking about it a bit more and, and you know, and come to realisation that, you know, we had in Mourinho probably one of the most pragmatic, uh, defensive minded uh, coaches of the big leagues out there at the moment. Right. He's not he's not uh, he's not exactly the most trendy coach in terms of his tactics. It was no surprise that maybe if another manager comes in who kind of opts for a more attacking style of play, that it was going to be absolute night and day from the performance that we saw on the Mourinho. And we saw that with Solskjaer. He, I think he only had like 48 hours of the players. Uh, Carrick and, and McKenna had the first two days of the week. And then uh, I think um, Solskjaer took over on the Thursday and the Friday. So he didn't really have that much time to implement any you know, systems of play or whatever. But just the kind of, ex- the, 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 ma- the kind of mantra or the... The things that he was coming out with post the match, post the game, saying that he wants the players to express themselves. He says we've got really good attacking players there. He wants them to kind of go out there and enjoy themselves again and, and see how and kind of feel again how amazing it is to play for such a big club. And we kind of saw that performance from the very first minute on. For the very, very first minute on. Effort aside, forget the effort, forget the closing down, forget the high pressing and all that stuff, right? I think just the, the the touches that the players were taking over across the pitch just showed that there was a difference. Because I think if you've watched Man United, if you've watched any team that struggles, what usually happens is that the players on the pitch start hiding. And I've played football, right? It's never to that kind of level. I played kind of like standard Sunday League football. And you know, when you're having a bad game, you hide on the pitch. You can hide. You can like purposely stand behind players that are marking you. You can purposely stand away from the player that's got the ball in order to not receive it in tight areas because you don't want to make a mistake. But you will receive it in open areas and start passing it square, start passing it sidewards, not really taking the chance to pass uh, to do kind of forward passes that that have a high risk of being intercepted. And we saw the difference underneath Olegan Solskjaer. We had players who were taking the ball, receiving the ball in really tight areas. Uh, we had Matic, one of the players that's been um, criticised by a lot of fans, me included, who's kind of for the last 18 months or so has been probably one of the worst performing players in our side, mostly because Mourinho didn't rotate him through the team, but also uh, basically because he was p- 
played in a two-man midfield where most of his most of his time was spent passing the ball sideways to either a right back or a full back, never to somebody in their feet up up front. Whenever Rashford would make runs previously, he wouldn't pass it to him. But we saw the difference playing on these uh, Solskjaer. We saw Natish trying to ping balls over the top for a striker to run onto. We saw him spraying the ball out wide to right backs so or whoever was on the wing in order to receive it to make an attacking run. We saw him run forward towards the goal. Like, insane to see. Insane, 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 insane. What a difference it made. And um, just the general mood, the happiness of the, of the side. Like, we got luck. We got quite lucky in terms of uh, scoring the goal really early on. Uh, Marcus Rashford scored the free kick, um, which, again, came from Pogba trying to make something happen outside the area. He tried to do a little one-two around the player, got taken down. Rashford takes the, Rashford takes the free kick and rifles it into the bottom corner. Looking at it again, because I watched the game back for two or three times, the full match, because it was that good of a game. Um, you could blame the keeper for not saving that. Um, the, the the free kick that Rashford took, and uh, it was hit exactly where the keeper should have been. The wall was covering the other side, and Efren really should have been covering the other side of the goal. And instead, he kind of got caught in two minds, stood kind of in the middle, and you know had no chance by the ball came beside him. Um, and just generally, the play was just amazing to see. Amazing to see us playing with such attack and intent. Honestly, Marshall was on fire. Ra- Rashford was on fire. Um, Lingard was on fire. Lingard was absolutely everywhere over that pitch. I think his average touch map had his spots like covering the entire front half of that pitch. We had fullbacks that were advancing into the opposing area's half, which never ever happens. Usually, whenever we had that, when Mourinho was in charge, he wanted that's what he wanted. He wanted a bit more of a compact team, so the fullbacks tucked in a little bit more, and our entire backline was in our half. But if you saw the kind of, um, if you saw the game, you would have seen our two centre backs in Jones and Lindelof uh, in our half, right? They're the only two people in our half, and then the right, the fullbacks in uh, Shaw and Young were inside the op- opposing half, like into and forward and offering up that extra um, option of an attack going forward from the from, from the flanks. I think whenever I saw the lineup going forward before the match started, I think we all kind of thought that, you know, this is just going to be another one of those games where um, we kind of played the same sort of Mourinho side. There wasn't as many changes that we all kind of hoped there would be. Uh, when I saw the lineup, I was a little bit disappointed. I'm not going to I'm not gonna lie. But then when we started playing and the interchanging of the team and stuff, it just all kind of exactly, exactly made sense. Um, so here's the team, right? The team that we played against Cardiff so you kind of a standard team really for the most part uh you had uh, Lindelof and Jones playing at center back which I was surprised at seeing Jones being picked there because he's been one of our most erratic defenders and I think um of all defenders we have available he's probably the one that's probably the most unreliable due to just he's he's a horrendous injury record and generally just being a bit of a shit defender everything that he does always involves him rushing always involves a last ditch tackle but also also I decided to go go for him instead of Bailey then we had Young and Shaw at the full backs and then we had a midfield field of Herrera, Matic and Pogba. For the most part, Matic was kind of covering the back four. Herrera was kind of a, a bit forward and then a, a bit more in front of Matic and then Pogba was the most advanced in midfield. And what actually happened if you saw the game was that with that happening, it freed up Matic, it freed up Herrera so that he could then be a little bit more box to box in that midfield area and just do a lot of those first time uh, passes forward into the attack. Now, Herrera's never going to be Xavi, right? He's never going to be a fucking Busquets or whatever. He's not that level. But what he does do really well is that he gets the ball out of his feet really quickly. He's very good at kind of scanning the area around him before he receives the ball, receiving it on one touch and then distributing it straight away. And because he... He's got a bit of an engine around him. He's really, really got. He's got high, high, high levels of endurance. He can cover loads of that space in in between the mid, the kind of the mid midfield and the up front. And then you got Pogba furthest forward. He's kind of bit, got a bit of a free roll, but he was more on the left hand side, which has been kind of his like uh, most favorite position of midfield, where he can cut in and maybe have some shots on target or dink some balls over the top. So he had a very, very balanced midfield. Instead of having Matic and Herrera effectively holding hands in front of the, of the defense and then relying on Pogba to, with all that too much space in front of him to do everything once in between, you had Matic, you had Herrera just in front of him, then you had Pogba, then you had uh, Lingard dropping in and kind of covering his flanks. An absolutely sterling performance. Now, the issue that we have here going forward, I think, is for the players missing. I think for a Sanchez, if you saw us playing today, yesterday, you would have probably, or over the weekend, you, if you're Sanchez, you'd be very confident you'd be able to play. Because that quick attacking football, that kind of like quick passing around the box 
one two touches loads of triangles everywhere Sanchez was going to flourish you're going to see you will hopefully see the best of him playing that system because I think when Mourinho was here he tried to play Sanchez as like a quintessential number nine and kind of pump little balls long to him even though Sanchez's hold up play is quite good for how small he is that's not his strength his main strength is kind of running through the channels running behind strikers running behind the defender story and maybe the one two touches around the box and because he's, he's finishing around the box is fucking lethal so if you're Sanchez, you're going to be confident you're going to get into a team. If you're Lukaku and you're watching that game, you're probably not going to be as confident. But still, I'd have a, I'd, I'd still say he has a, he has a, a future in the side of Raw. Because I think with, drug, with, with, uh, with Lukaku, sorry, the issue that I think I had with him, especially with Mourinho, what he was playing with him, what you saw was that because he, he looks like he looks so physically imposing, right? We as, automatically assumed that he would be the next Pogba, the next uh, the next big striker like Drogba, for instance, right? But that is not necessarily the case. He's not in that mold. If anything, he's more of a fox in a box. He's more of a, a Michael Owen type striker, just like with a ridiculous physical build, right? But so what he needs, he needs balls through the channels. He needs balls in behind, over, over, over the top of defenders for him to run onto, crosses into the box so he can head up. But he doesn't need long balls from the defense all the way up front for him to bring down, touch into the midfield and then run onto. That's not his game. His game is running off the shoulder of the last defender. So I think with the style of play that we're playing now, there is a possibility too, with Pogba playing in that advanced role, with Lingard running around in between the lines and with Martial uh, hugging left outside the pitch. There's a possibility that Lukaku, we could probably could see the best of him too. But then the same token, there also is the uh, the the thinking that Lukaku doesn't necessarily play well in that kind of fast-flowing football team, counter-attacking in that regard. Rashford, for all these kind of um, inconsistencies of his finishing, he plays that role really well. He ran the whole entire game, up and down. I think also, uh, there's a stat there, I think that was the first game in the whole season that we've outran our position. Now, the running stats... Running up to stats, wherever can sometimes you can read too much into them, right? Because so, somebody covered uh, a, a amount of distance, it doesn't necessarily mean they played well. But I think that goes to show just how much intensity they were playing at, right? So I don't think you can get that kind of level of intensity with Lukaku. This is my opinion. But I think in general, um, it was a great game. I think everyone kind of like did themselves justice. We have we're gonna have much done. The test is coming up. I think Cardiff will probably uh, uh, the perfect side for Solskjaer to kind of get his first game underneath his belt they're struggling for confidence they're probably going to be one of the teams that can be favored to go down uh, they had effectively no threat uh, going forward apart from Murphy on the left hand side who gave Ashley Young some problems but for the most part they didn't really have any sort of um, problems that they were causing us for the game um, there was another player that came on as well Zohor Zohor is it Zohor number 10 for Cardiff came on towards the end of the game uh, he he played pretty well and he, Kenny probably did himself justice to probably get a start yeah Kenneth Zohor he come on the 60th minute he probably did quite well but for the most part they were quite uh, toothless up front and we exploited their defensive um, uh, insecurities for the most part I think we'll have much done the test to come I think it would be good to see what different tactics he operate and uh, Matosha kind of uh, uses in other games to kind of uh, take into account the limitations of our team but i'm also liking the fact that he's realized that we might not be as strong defensively but we have some of the best attacking players in the league i think in terms of our attacking lineup in terms of what we the the, the options that we have coming off the bench i don't think i'd swap my options for any other team in the, in the league but the, the one part we are suffering from a lot we don't have, have any quality it's really in, in defense especially for the fullbacks we have ensure somebody that hasn't really played that many games we have Dan Delo, who's probably an experience we have luke uh ashley young who's a converted right back, a converted winger, sorry, and then we have centre-backs who necessarily haven't necessarily pulled up any trees. So that's where we can kind of be a bit shaky, but I like the fact that Solskjaer is, regard, is kind of um, in a position where he'd rather concentrate on us scoring more goals in opposition as opposed to trying to shut the opposition out, which Marino did. So overall, a great game. I can't wait for the game against Huddersfield on Wednesday. That should be another, probably a bit more of a sterner test. Huddersfield are a much better team than Cardiff are. They've got a more astute managers able to kind of maybe change things up, maybe ask us different questions. And plus, everyone's seen us play now. They've seen the way, what we have and what we can offer. So maybe it's going to be a bit more of a harder test going forward. But overall, great game. I was happy with it. I'm happy with the level of performance. Happy to see Pogba have such a uh, dominant performance too. He really kind of showed everyone up. Um, he was kind of criticizing him and saying that you know he wasn't playing for the manager, which he obviously wasn't. But we do know there's a there, there's a talented player there. There's a real world class talent there. He obviously needs to kind of step up now because you know he's got no excuses either. Mourinho, the guy that he hates, has finally gone. Now he needs to really show us what he's capable of doing. But yeah, five one man, five one. 
It's fucking incredible. And then our uh, manager to be, if you believe all the rumors online, our manager to be in Pochettino also won his games. Right, Tottenham won away at Everton six two, which is no mean feat. Everton. I know Marcus Silva doesn't really necessarily play the most defensive type football and it is all out attack. Both teams just kind of going for it. But, you know, Everton are a far better side than they were in yesteryear. So for Tottenham to go there and win uh, by six goals to two is a fucking insane. He's really done the business there, especially without spending any sort of money as well over the summer. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next six months. I guess if Solskjaer wins the league, I'm sorry, if Solskjaer wins the Champions League with United and then wins the, I don't know, the FA Cup or something along those kind of lines, I guess maybe he might get the job. That's probably the only way he's going to keep his job. Um, but then also there is the question of like, would Pochino want to come to United? Well, it might just be a Diego Simeone thing, right? It might be like maybe the grass isn't always green on the other side. Diego Simeone has had loads of chances to leave Atletico Madrid and never has left them. And yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's, you know what? I built this team from scratch. Let me just stay and see what I can do next year, the year after that. Plus Tottenham are moving into a new stadium. There might be more funds available. They never know. There might be more investment coming in. It might be the worst time to leave Tottenham in that regard, to, to go to a United club that's a bit dysfunctional at the moment. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to see what happens next. I'm interested to see what happens if, if, we, if we don't get Pochettino. to see what we do next. Do we then go for another unconventional manager? Do we decide to go for somebody who hasn't got any qualifications? Uh, I mean, CV-wise, in terms of trophies, I'm interested to see what direction we're going next. But yeah, overall, 5-1 to United against Cardiff. I'm happy as Larry! Anyway, on some topics, enough about the ball of the foot or the foot of the ball. Let's just get right into it, guys. I love that stuff. It's so annoying, but I love it. Okay, first things first. Delivery 100. So Delivery did like a little roundup of um, you know top 100. I think items ordered. You know, everyone kind of does the yearly roundup thing. And number one, I want to kind of go through it and kind of read through some things that I thought were quite interesting. But number two, also just the the general shittiness of the display of the kind of like um sorry the the presentation of this kind of news is so it there's a thing these places right you you go you're trying to like i'd imagine trying to get a job at delivery is pretty difficult right trying to get into the head office i'd imagine being one of their social media team marketing is probably a quite privileged situation right because you know um delivery is well known you know it's got some good social cachet be like, oh you work at delivery wow it's quite amazing so i imagine it's not the easiest place to go get a job at but then you look at the presentation of this of this delivery newsroom section of their website where they post stuff right it's called the newsroom i don't know what the fuck that's about it's so dead right you'd, you'd imagine it'll be there'd be some like infographics there'd be some like animation or something else and look what look what it looks like just like a a shitty wordpress blog right with like on the right hand side column they've got media recent articles and tags and tags is like massive all the like, tags that they use for the articles all all on show it's not hidden everything's there for you to check out um and it's just like the layout's so weird the le- text is on the left hand side to the right which most places have it at um it's just a list of fucking words and text the pictures are massive they haven't been formatted correctly. Look at it. Like, no, does no one use a blogger application that you can see a preview of the post? Look how massive the pictures are. Some pictures are different dimensions. It's just an absolute shit show. So it's just like, it's crazy, isn't it? Some this is someone's job, and they get paid very, very handsomely to do so. And then if you try to apply for a role here, they'll, they, you know, they'll, they'll make you jump through so many hoops to get positioned there. Yet this is the kind of level of things that they present to you, like. Absolutely shocking. But anyway, enough about that. Um, so, delivery reveals the top 100 dishes ordered in 2008 around the world. Some interesting kind of uh, additions here. So, this is from everywhere. I would have liked to have seen it, you know, again, like how the Google Reports thing I showed you guys um, the few a few weeks ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago, showed which I showed you, it looks a bit nicer where you can kind of select it um, based on the, the region, based on the country and stuff. Like, why don't you just give me the ability to look at it that way? Like, get someone to build it you make enough money like do that so just having a text list of options like this is something that you can just get off of an excel sheet you just export it you know valued from decreasing uh and, and then you kind of just list the items on there there's no real work that's gone into this at all or effort let's say anyway um the number one item that's been ordered from delivery in 2018 is pad thai from thai at home in paris Number two in the world, right, is a cheeseburger from Five Guys in London, which is fucking insane. So, what do they not have delivery in, in America or something? Why is this the whole world? It's the maybe it's Uber Eats is the most dominant thing there. That's strange, isn't it? Right? I don't know why. Do, I'd imagine, yeah, strange in the entire world. 
the two, top two locations are Paris and London. I'm not too sure about that one. But anyway, cheeseburger from Five Guys. Sushi Lovers uh, Poke Bowl from, uh, what's that place called? Cali Pokey in Dubai is number three. Number four is a burrito from Boojum in Dublin. And number five is a bubble tea from Ten Rand's Tea in Hong Kong. Of course, the Chinese people love bubble tea and it's fucking gross. It's so horrible. Um, grilled Chicken Burrito number six from German Y Gomez. It's from Guzman. From Guzman y Guzman. Uh, in Sydney, and then from number seven is a burrito from Gonzalez and Co in Barcelona. Number eight, beef burger from Tommy's Burger Joint in Berlin. Oh, I've been there actually. Fucking banging, absolutely banging. Really, really good uh, burgers. And um, I think I went there before I left for the airport um, to come back. My recent trip from Berlin, actually, I tried to. I just basically went there to waste some time, have a burger, and I think I'm gonna say it was like ten euros. The burger was absolutely insane. Let me let me get it up. Actually, I'll show you guys. It's so 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 tasty. Um, Tommy's Burger Joint in Berlin. It was so bloody nice. I really really liked it. I think it was about 10, 15 euros or something like that. Um, and I had a good time there. It came in about fifteen or so minutes or something along those kind of lines. Um. Yeah, it was fairly tasty burger, very succulent, great fries. They had great sauces on the side that you could order as well. Um, I'll show you here, actually. There you go. Look at that burger. Look how that looks. Looks beautiful, doesn't it? Our burger. Mm -mm 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 -mm. And I love and I love the bars that have the little um, what's that kind of like you call it a circle counter? The counter you can kind of sit around. I love that in the middle, like a kind of, like an island, right? You call that right? I'm assuming you call it an island bar. I really like that. So yeah, they've got how many locations there? Oh, they've got three locations in Berlin actually. In Mitte, in Friedrichstraße, and whatever that word is, Kud Kudem, Kudem. But yeah, um, I recommend uh, Tommy's Burger Joint. Super, super, super tasty. Um, so yeah, what is on the next on the list? And then uh, number nine, the Poke Bowl from Ten Market in Amsterdam, and number ten, two hot wings from KFC in Brighton. So what I'm surprised in seeing is the uh, the cheeseburger from Five Guys. Not sh I haven't really been on the whole burger tip for a while now, but when I did, well, when I was eating a lot of burgers, I I found Five Guys great. Don't get me wrong; it's probably the, it's probably what the Burger King Whopper wants to be, right? I, I guess the the double the, the Whopper Burger King they can't really make it to that level of expertise because you know they they having to serve so many people across so many different locations, you know. But the, you know, one thing that kind of is a slight on Burger King as opposed to most places, again, it's a high street place, are probably not a good example. But one thing that really gets annoys me is the discrepancy in the standards uh, from one location to the other. Um, the fall off in quality is fucking insane. That's the one thing that McDonald's have been really good at uh, achieving. Most of the locations, uh, location independent really, the, no matter where you are, you are likely to get a fairly decent burger at each location, right? Um, there's not going to be such a big drop off rate. But I think in Burger King's in regards, which only anyone you go to around the country, you're going to get varying levels of quality in terms of the finish, in terms of how they garnish it. It's just, it's just too, there's too, it's too, it's too broad. And I'm assuming it's something to do with how they make the menu overall. But when I went to Five Guys, what I found was perfect about it was that it reminded me of a Burger King Whopper, but it reminded me of what a Whopper should look, taste like. Very succulent. Um, the patty was not as moist as other places was. It wasn't dripping as much as other places was. And I like the fact that the bun kind of stuck to the burger uh, patty for the most part because they wrap it in aluminium. So all the kind of heat gets conserved in there. And I loved it. And I love the fact that you can garnish it um, from the bottom up, right? So you can basically, it comes as is, or you can then start adding the garn, the, the pickles and lettuce, what stuff, malarkey. Because some places, they just come standard with like the lettuce, tomato, and pickles, and you have to kind of dress it down a little bit. But I like the fact that you can kind of start garnishing it from the bottom upwards. And I think I kind of just did the standard uh, uh, shredded lettuce and tomatoes. It might not be shredded, it might just be regular lettuce, but yeah, that's just kind of the regular guys that I kind of go for. But I wouldn't have suspected Five Guys would be the best of all the burgers. I have to say, um, uh, Meat Liquor probably was one of my favorites. In terms of, and I say Meat Liquor only because from, from, from going to their burger, uh, their food trucks when they first started, right? Being kind of the first kind of people that kind of uh, taste their burgers there. And then seeing the evolution of the company from going if you get an investment and then opening up various branches. I think they've had such a long time to uh, um, hypothetically fuck up and they haven't. They have to give it to uh, Meat Liquor. You know, they've had such op they've had so many opportunities. A any other burger joint, if they've got level of investment that uh, Meat Liquor got, the level of media coverage, their standards would have slipped a long, long time ago. And, they and every time I think they're going to flop, 
it just gets better and better. If anything, the only thing, only complaint I have about meat liquor is that the burger size has kind of decreased over time. From the time, of course, I'm not expecting it to be the same size as, the, as they made it when they were uh, serving them in food trucks um, outside of pubs. But um, I've seen a considerable difference in the size of the burger from the time I ate in one of their restaurants, I think in Hoxton, uh, to now, if I go there again. It's, a, it's very, very small compared to what it was previously. Even the... the um, the chili cheese fries, I think, as well, is quite small. I remember going there from before and then tasting it again. It was a bit more of a smaller dish overall. Again, maybe it's just me and my eyes. Maybe, you know, you get older, stuff, things have to look a bit smaller than what they were previously. But I am pretty sure that the burger is a bit smaller than what it used to be previously. But that aside, the, the meat patty itself, the bun, the garnishes, the cheese, A1. So I would, I'm surprised that Meat Liquor hasn't made that list of all the worlds. And again, just because, you know, the delivery list is a bit shitty and how they kind of put it together. I don't even know if that's actually true. I don't know if that's actually because I don't... Something that I, I just doubted that the two, lo two, two top locations around the world that I get delivery are Paris and London. Just it doesn't seem correct to me. But I wouldn't exactly think the again the Five Guys Burger is a great burger, but I wouldn't necessarily put it in my top five um, of burgers I've had in general. But yeah, I will put the list of the link below in the description so you can check out yourself. Um, you can see all the massive pictures that I haven't been formatted correctly, but it's up to you. Anyway, what's next on my list here? Cashless pizza spot. Oh, this is a new development, right? So this new restaurant or this new pizza restaurant is this is kind of uh, figuring out, uh, testing a new initiative of not accepting any cash at, at their restaurant, which is, I guess it's not the most um, um, innovative idea. I think most places are starting to implement uh, cashless because I think it's to do with uh, general... Um, for Jimmy's do general administrative duties, right? It, it takes up a lot of time and cash on that malarkey. And I think uh, for the most part, I'm going to say Stockholm, uh, I think the city center, most places don't accept cash, right? It's all contactless pay or credit cards and stuff. But I thought this was a pretty interesting article. Um, so I'll get up on here on screen and read it quickly. Uh, London's outstanding pizza Napoleon uh, group goes cashless, right? So this is the article here from Eater. It's called London's Outstanding Napoleon Pizza Group Goes Cashless. So I'll read it here below. Uh, Santa Maria Pizzeria Group, London's Outstanding Napoleon Pizza Restaurant Group, has announced that it will stop taking cash payments across its branches uh, in Ealing, Fulham and Fitzrovia in the new year. A fourth location could also arrive in the new year. It's amazing how many restaurants they open at one time, right? The restaurant business, I wish, I wish, I wish, 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 wish. Uh, London Mayor Sadiq Khan or anyone involved with the entertainment industry overall would put as much care and attention into the nightlife industry as they do restaurants. Restaurants in London for the most part, especially the ones that do well, if they do well, they open up two or three branches in an instant. It's like a chain effect. Like, you know, Pizza Pilgrims is a good example, right? They start from a food v truck, quote unquote, van thing on the, in that market, I've got the name of it, and they go from there to one restaurant. Now they've got two straight away within the space of a year. I would love to, if that same kind of love and care and kind of foresightness would go into kind of the clubbing industry. Oh, that would be so cool. We'd have so many cool places to go to if they had that much attention to it. Because obviously they bring a lot of money into the local neighborhood overall. But hey, what do I know? Um, continue reading the article. Um, in Instagram post this lunchtime, the owners announced a New Year's resolution. From 2019, all our branches will go cashless and only take payments with credit cards. We won't have any cash left on this premises and we'll know and we'll know our tax situation straight away. In the comments replying to a user who voiced concerns for those unable to bank account, uh, such as refugees and homeless and bad credit history. <laughs> people, the questions people ask, imagine imagine asking in the comments, oh, what about people that are bank, are refugees, homeless and have bad credit history? Like, I don't know. If it, if that's me, right, I'm going to tell you, quite, quite point blankness, right? If you're a refugee and you've got bad credit or you don't have a bank account, you probably shouldn't be eating out. Like, you should just take an, you should just take an L on some things in life. You shouldn't be trying to do everything. People, not everyone should be accommodating you. You have other things. You have probably bigger things to worry about than eating out at a Napoleon, Napoleon Pizza Group fucking restaurant, shouldn't you, if you're a refugee? You must have better things to worry about in terms of, like, getting your status sorted out in the country or saving your money up in order to kind of start a business. I don't know, other things. The comments people ask, and again, it's never the people that are affected that are asking the question. It's not like the refugees or the people that have bad credit are asking the comments, oh, what about me? They just will go somewhere else. Like, it's such a weird thing to say. Anyway, um... 
As I take it in this essay, which argues of the potentially social exclusiveness implications of not taking cash in business, if a homeless person or refugee wants a pizza, we'll give it to them for free. Yeah, that's just the way to go. Going cash has increased in popularity in New York City over the past 18 months. A city whose restaurant scene is often a source of inspiration for London operators, exposed bricks, cocktail and jars. Since the downsides of operators in an increasingly digital world, since the, since the downsides for operators in an increasingly digital world, at least for a certain kind of fast casual consumer business and negligible, it could be adopted to increase the regularity in London. So I would assume going cashless would just be general admin, right? Like cashing up is just taking too long. You have to maybe hire a, a quote unquote girl or boy that sits on a cash till and all that sort of stuff and theft, blah, 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 blah. I'm assuming just like, you know, in terms of just like taking out the ball leg and running a restaurant, having no cash, it just makes life a lot more easier. And general just accounting duties, all that sort of malarkey. But the only problem I have with it, which I which I would um, didn't think about earlier, and I just kind of popped in my head now, is what you would do with tips. I know this has been a big conversation within the restaurant industry, you know, whether or not you should tip or not, like how should tips should be implemented in restaurants, whether it's a service charge, blah, blah, blah. But it's kind of, well, it's kind of a, it's kind of common knowledge that most people that work within the industry, for some reason, I don't think this, I don't think this should be a thing. I think this is where it kind of, they kind of lose me in the restaurant world. For some reason, it's generally accepted that everyone gets paid a low hourly wage, right? Even though most restaurant, uh, even though most people that work within the hospitality industry work like insane hours right so they work really long hours in general as opposed to people that work in offices so it doesn't make much sense why they get compensated less per hour than someone who works in office it makes really really no sense of course maybe not like for like but the hourly wage should be bumped up a little bit more but it's not so the reason the reason why they say you should tip is because you know they don't get paid as much hourly so the extra money you're tipping is going to make up the difference quote unquote but i think what they should do is just pay people what they should be paid for that role, especially if you're going to work 12 hours a day, right, for a shift, you know, to kind of, you know, make sure the restaurant up is up and running and you can do your covers and have the added bonus of let's also pay a tip on top. That's just how it should be. It shouldn't be you living for your tips because, you know, living for tips is probably like it's not the best thing for your mental space in general, right? And it's not nice to maybe see the worst in people that you're kind of doting over and giving them excellent excellent service and then they decide to just get up and leave and not leave you even one pound on the tray. That can be really demoralizing. I think to, uh, to kind of circumvent all that, just pay everyone a good base salary and then also have the added kind of... Um, uh pointers out there for patrons if they feel like their server or their waiter or the chef or the restaurant did a really good bang up job on that particular occasion leave a tip that you know reflects your gratitude for what they've done simple nothing about 10 percent or whatever it is just simply tell people everyone gets paid here a good wage right let's say they get let's let's say the the low wage is four pound let's say everyone gets paid eight pound that's double right what they should they should be they get paid by the industry where a restaurant that pays our employees eight pound an hour whether you're a kitchen porter scrubbing uh saucepans or you're a, sh- a sous chef you all get paid a minimum of eight pounds okay and it obviously goes up depending on the kind of level of responsibility and whatever you do there no problem but then just have everyone also pay extra on tips. I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily see the tip thing as being that bad or divisive. And then in most place, places, I think I, I know for sure, um, having watched that uh, reality TV show Below Deck, which I recommend you check out, it's fucking amazing. It's really, really trashy, but it's also really good because it exposes you to a whole different working environment which I had no idea about. And it's a, it follows basically a group of people that work on chartered, but on chartered yachts, whatever. So the whole idea is like, you know, this is like a, a luxury hotel on the sea. So it kind of goes through how they kind of prepare for the guests that are coming on there. And uh, in general, something I didn't know about it, and again, I'm not too sure, I haven't done research, I don't know how much they get paid hourly, but they work entirely for the tips. But they do leave massive tips. So sometimes if like, someone charters the boat for three days, the patron, if they come with 10 people, might leave a grand tip for each person, right? And then the the the, the boat, the yacht staff, quote unquote, they kind of split that, that, that tip equally amongst them. And the splitting of the tip equally really kind of opened my eyes up to like, oh, that's why they all work really hard collectively for a common goal because they're all working towards one tip. And there's no like bickering or complaining that, you know, the girls working behind a bar aren't working as hard as you because you're scrubbing the side of the boat. No, you're all working to a common goal because if you don't scrub the boat and she doesn't do the drinks all night long and don't, and forego sleep, then you're not going to get the tip that you need. So you're, you're all kind of working at, at the same sort of level, even though maybe physically they're different sort of demands. Collectively, you're all working for the same sort of um, end goal or aim in order to kind of make sure the guests are happy 
So I think if you implement a, a way that, you know, you paid all the waiters and workers in a, a restaurant a fair wage, then you allowed, then you kind of gave the incentive to patrons to come in and also leave people tips in the, if they felt like they were um, served really well. And then the tips that you did receive, you will put them all into one pot and you split it equally amongst people. I think that's amazing. I think that would that'll do amazing for team, team morale because you know you're always going to get a thousand... 500 a month or whatever it is standard wage coming into your account and you're going to get stuff for something on top i think that will really really kind of take things forward the next uh an extra step and also might kind of help with staff retention because i know uh hospitality industry is a lot like uh retail industry where staff turnover is super high right because usually for the most part the mid the entry level to mid level jobs don't pay as well as they should do so people usually end up like bouncing around from place to place and kind of looking to kind of get more experience under the belt so they can eventually kind of apply for a higher position but if you decide to pay your your, your kitchen porter and your sous chef a minimum of eight pound an hour no one's going to leave that job especially for the most part if they if they get tips on top of it as well like and they're going to work doubly hard um so yeah I, i'm not really sure why restaurants don't do that what places don't do i'm sure there's a reason for it that i'm not really that aware of um there was an article that i actually saw recently just now uh by the restaurant critic jay rayner for the guardian which i thought was pretty cool kind of laid out his kind of reservations behind why he doesn't think uh tipping in restaurants should be a thing anymore and i'll quickly read out a little bit of this and then we can move on um, so this is a this is an article by Jay Rayner. It's called "It's Time to It's Time for Restaurants to Get Rid of Tip for Tips," and it says the following: um, "I'm a control freak, and as much and as such, completely um, unsuited to my job as a restaurant critic." Uh -huh. every time i visit a, a restaurant i am in effect ceding control of my night out to complete strangers the waiters who will be looking after me um this makes me antsy usually i know nothing about them i know i have no guarantees they will show me a good time ah but it's okay because they have an incentive to do so the discretionary tip i may leave them at the end of the meal as if that really makes a difference it's time i think to acknowledge that the notion of tips is crass outmoded dysfunctional and ultimately inefficient system ill suited to service and industry and uh, industry age uh, we all read stories over the years about high street change changing uh, charging fees to administer tips or using them to top up wages clearly it's now so muddled and tainted as to have outlived its usefulness the restaurant business needs to follow the lead of few enlightened souls and scrap the concept of tips and service charge altogether can i have a really um can I have? Can I really have a control over my meal via discretionary service charge? No, which is interesting. So I guess some people see tips as a way for you to have control over the quality of your meal. I never saw it like that. I think um, I never expected. Yeah, I know it's because you leave a tip at the end of the meal. So I never really expected my level because how you that doesn't really make no sense. Why would people think you're going to get a better meal if you leave a better tip? If you're going to leave the tip at the end of the meal, um, I just saw the tip as just like an acknowledgement of the person's hard work. Or if you felt like they did a really good job, if they went out uh, above and beyond to kind of give you a good, to make sure you had a good time, or the food was just really tasty, or the great ambiance, like that's what I saw tips. I never saw tips as like a, I don't know, as a way to kind of like guilt trip someone to make sure they do a good job. Like that's not necessarily a thing. I don't know. But hey, he's a restaurant critic. Maybe I, I'm talking out my ass here. Um, back again. Um, it continues. Uh, may often be called discretionary, but it's a brave soul who refuses to pay it. But there's a brace of who to pay it. But it goes further. When it, when, whether I pay or not, I have no way of knowing whether the staff received the money unless I interrogate them on the matter, which is hardly my idea of great end of, of a night. I could always leave cash, I suppose. But in, in the age of plastic, who can guarantee to have that on them every time? And again, who knows where it goes, even so. Which is true, right? I guess if you've got a... I guess sometimes restaurant... It doesn't always happen like that, but sometimes you do get that rare occasions where... I'm not sure if that... Is that restaurant thing, right? It must be Pacific Restaurant Rule, where the person that's... um. Uh, the person that work well the person that takes your order just serves you throughout the entire night usually doesn't happen that way usually you have different people coming you know depending on how busy the restaurant is you might someone might serve you someone might take your order another person might bring out your dish another person might bring you your drinks because you know they're all moving around the place all over the place right but sometimes you can get those occasions where uh, the guy or girl that's serving you is serving you throughout the entire night and you feel like oh you know what they've done a bang up job man I want to give them a little reward a little gift for making sure that we had a great night and you and you hand them over the cash the tip is kind of your assuming that they're going to get it but once you leave the restaurant you don't know who picks up the tray and takes it to the till you know it could be anybody so somebody else can some be jacking someone's tips but I always thought that tips were split um, amongst everyone unless you specifically give them the person a, a money like hey 
this specifically for you. I thought usually you get split amongst the whole staff. Um, and again, that's what I said in terms of like raise the minimum wage of everyone up a couple of pounds, right? So everyone can can can, can cover their nut for the most part. And then on top of that, they also earn tips that split equally amongst everyone on the I don't know restaurant floor. I think that might be a best way to do it. And I don't know why they don't do it again. So it's really kind of um it's really cunty at restaurant business of ruin bosses like especially depending especially considering just how hard restaurant people work if you watch any sort of show about restaurants um uh like i don't know even a kitchen nightmare which was kind of a crass kind of example of it but most shows that show people sign up a restaurant business whatever it's an unforgiving job it requires you having to put in your heart and soul into it every kind of inch of sweat gets poured into that business you can't take any days off you have to work around the clock in order to kind of make sure it's success and even though even though even if you do that sometimes most more likely not you're going to be a failure because restaurant business you know the the risk of failure is super super high and then they don't you know uh adequately pay people it's so weird it's a very 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 bizarre notion that happens there uh back to your article again uh, but there's a bigger issue. Either we regard waiters as a literal, literally servile to be rewarded at our whim, or we think they have the right to uh, the dignity of a wage that is both reliable and reasonable, which is very, very true here. Um, do I need to tell you I think the latter is only the way forward? Um, the naysayers argue that without tips, we have no way of showing our approval or disapproval. Not true, which I agree with. We should show our disapproval exactly as we do now by never visiting the restaurants again, which I totally agree with. That's why I don't usually, that's why I don't really necessarily agree with uh, writing negative reviews. I do, do, I, I do write reviews on my, on my blog sometimes. You should check it out. Um, on default goon it's underneath the tag munch that i just sometimes re- write reviews but i only write reviews for stuff that i like for the most part i don't necessarily write reviews for stuff that i don't like even the stuff that i'm not sure about i'm not too fan of like when i went to um chicken sours a couple of times i wasn't really a fan of it there was stuff that i did like about it and commented it but if i don't like an experience completely i just won't write about it same with restaurants if i don't like somewhere where i went i just won't go again um which i think is something that a lot of um is a lot of uh customers don't necessarily know how much power they have in that kind of little action anyway it continues um and as to showing approval there are various ways including saying an effusive thank you which is something people who are already being paid properly always appreciate and yes you could always leave more cash on the table though as they will be being paid a decent way there's less a reason to do so the only real argument involves the naughty issue of that which is not applied to tips that are freely given but surely it's not beyond the wit of an industry to sit down with the tax authorities in both well, I, well in Brussels argued that the case for a lower VAT rate for hospitality industry say what 17.5% to deal with that matter. Alternative restaurants can simply take the hit as both Danny Meyer of the Union Square Group and, and in the US and the Gallivant House, sorry, the Gallivant Hotel near Rye have already done, arguing that it's better for businesses in the long run if quality employees are incentivized by secure incomes. In turn, diners will see menu prices rise, but they'll know that the price they see is a price they pay and that the people serving them are properly looked after. This Sunday's addition of the yeah, yeah. Okay, I agree. I 100% agree. I love that little line about... um if the kind of prices in the restaurant go up at least you know that the staff are being paid this is something i've kind of always talked about when it comes to uh having a like you know when you go to spain or those kind of countries you always go to a bar where they have little pinchos on the table that you could always eat at the bar for free maybe it'd be some bread it might be some nuts whatever maybe and i always said like especially in england where we have a problem with alcohol abuse or people are a little bit too indulgent with alcohol and probably drink a little bit too much to excess without kind of sub, uh, supplementing with any sort of food i wouldn't be opposed to going to a pub that all the pints were five pounds right and upwards right but then i knew that some of the reason why was to offset the price of some doritos or something on the table that are just for free that just come around the, the waiter just comes around every i don't know hour or so and refills everyone's bowl with chips and peanuts and whatever it may be on the bowl for free not something you have to pay for you know usually in the bars and pubs you go to the crisp bar of exorbitantly overpriced like a pack of whipping ready walker ch- chips are like i don't know uh two pounds or something stupid why not just offset the price on the beers so have all the beers be four pound or five pound minimum and upwards and then have free snacks like chips and stuff like that and then there might be other things that you that people can pay for pastries but for the most part the crisp and all that stuff is always free so that you get people are not going to be too fucked up over across the night because they're munching on breadsticks munching on twigs on doritos whatever it may be and um i guess you'd like to see an industry in restaurant too industry in that regard but i do like i kind of i don't mind the the notion of kind of over someone some cash because they've done a good job but i just guess for as a as a p- 
patron or someone that's going to a restaurant, I'd want to know that they split this, the, the tips equally amongst everyone. If they do that, then that's fine, right? I'm happy to kind of like, you know, leave a tip because I know in the night everyone's going to get an equal bit of the of the tip of road because everyone's kind of collectively did a good job in order to make sure we had a good experience. But interesting argument, interesting to see where it goes overall. Cashless, uh, minimum wage, all that malarkey. The VAT thing's a little bit dicey, I'm assuming, uh, because I'm sure their bosses are using that as an excuse for why minimum wages are cheap and they get VAT free. Uh, tax free on the tips and stuff but it's a bit stupid overall I'm not sure if a fan of that I think everyone should be paid a base salary overall especially now because you know most people eat out eating out was reserved for usually the kind of rich and famous remember it was a kind of a thing that not everyone did but now with the kind of advent and the rise of like food trucks turning into legitimate businesses and you know uh, the kind of fusion menus with that sort of malarkey um Everyone is kind of adventuring out. Like the discerning taste palette of a regular person in London has really, really um, kind of increased or gone up over the years, right? People are not kind of no, willing to kind of accept any sort of dross anymore. People want the best food that they can get within their price budget and they will go out and they will seek new places. They will queue up in the rain and stuff in order to kind of have that experience. So if that's the case, then the people working in there should be getting paid that level um, for, for to circumvent that kind of level of service too. It makes some common sense, especially if you're working in a kind of independent business, whatever it may be. Like why shouldn't the restaurant people working there that work in 16 hours a they be paid adequately it makes no sense um and it should be getting tips on top of that too what why not man do you know what I mean? like yeah but what do i know anyway what's next on the list here um da -da -da -da. top smartphone trends 2018 good little report here from text crunch which i thought was quite cool specifically for one point that i kind of was um eschewing a little bit forward so um i still have got my iphone 6s here which is completely smashed as you can see here from the from the camera, right? It's completely fucked up. It's smashed to smithereens there. All all broken up. I dropped it a few times as I usually do. And then I think one time that I did drop it when I was going out one day at a club. I dropped it on the floor and let a car run over it, but it didn't break it overall, which is fine. It kind of just smashed the screen, which is great. Um so but I've kept it. The reason why I've kept it is because the iPhone 6 still has uh touch ID. And I love Touch ID for contactless pay. It's my favorite, favorite thing. And um, when the iPhone, I think 8 is when they introduced um, the face recognition thing. I might I think it might have been 8. Um, I was really bummed out. I think it might have been 10, actually. Maybe the iPhone X. Whatever it was, I was really bummed out because I love Touch ID. I think Touch ID is one of my most favorite features of the iPhone of late, right? Um, when contactless pay came around, um, it took a while for people to kind of adopt contactless pay because, you know, there were kind of concerns about privacy, about the ease of how much you could spend, about the limits on it, blah, 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 blah. But over time, you know, um, with people having, you know, um, busy in, you know, busy metropolitan life, you know, you end up in a rush. People just tend to always want to tap and quickly move on. Right. Don't take receipts and keep it moving. And contactless pay is a good way to kind of circumvent that. You can link it to your card. and It's all kind of stored on there securely on your phone. And all you got to do is kind of raise it up to the read tap with your fingerprint and it kind of pays for it automatically and i kind of was more comfortable with that as an action overall as opposed to kind of raising the phone up to your face and then do you know what i mean it just didn't that kind of action just seemed a bit weird to me overall i just liked how intuitive it, it was just holding the phone in your hand because it's what you did naturally with your card anyway so when that kind of feature got taken off for the iphone x uh, the iphone 8 whatever it might have been however beautiful the design was that was one thing that i kind of was hoping would stay and it didn't stay and that's kind of been the reason why I necessarily haven't upgraded my phone. Now, most of it's to do with laziness. Most of it's to do with the fact that it's quite expensive, the phone anyway. But majority, if I'm really honest, is the fact that, you know, the the, the camera quality on the iPhone 6S is pretty high still. I can still record in 1080p if I want to record a quick YouTube video or whatever. Um, if I want to take a really high definition picture, I can do that still at this moment with this phone. And it's got to have the benefit of Touch ID. But this touch, this um, top trends report from 2019 also kind of issued the things to me because there's a there's a there's a thinking in the industry that what's going to happen is that they're going to bring back touch id i saw a rumor but it's going to be with a glass so with a with a bezel of screen so you know how the iphone x is where it's got no bezel right around it it's going to be the same but just on a touch id on the actual screen which is going to be fucking insane to see right I'm gonna, i can't wait so basically effectively the home button will come back but it won't be the home button as we know it, it won't be this kind of physical home button that we have here right it won't be this one it'll be like a home button that'll be on the glass right or it'll be a home button that comes up whenever you need it and i thought that was quite interesting so i've got the top trends here that i'm going to quickly run through and show you um Number one trend that was quite funny that I didn't see the point of is foldable because I'm sure some of you saw pictures of it. 
images of that. I think it was a Samsung phone that can kind of fold. Um, I didn't really get the point of it. Why would you want a foldable phone? Um, I, I, I would always imagine if you had a, if you had a kind of a, a new tablet, a new iPad Pro, or whatever, maybe you just have a bag that was adequately kind of fit it. You wouldn't necessarily be buying a coat that would fit that whole thing in one place. It just wouldn't be that comfortable to wear. But um, this article says here um, we've already seen two, well, one and a half really, and you can be sure we'll see even more as smartphone manufacturers scramble to figure out next big thing. Which is weird, isn't it? Why do you? It's so and it's it's such an old school. It's such a old school kind of idea, isn't it? in a new age right a foldable phone why would you want that you just the whole idea of the foldable phone is that you can't you can say so much you can fit into a small device right but we're making our phones smaller and thinner than they've ever been before of yesteryear so now they want to get things in bigger devices but they also want the added advantage of making them sm- be able to be foldable um and not, you know it's foldable but it's still got a little like a lot of an arch there like it's foldable to what extent to what really maybe to a certain extent of a book it looks like a standard book size but if you want a book size tablet just buy a book size tablet um anyway the article continues here um the royal is fascinating but ex- execution leaves something to be desired. Samsung's prototype, meanwhile, is just that. The company made it uh, the centerpiece of its recent developer conference, but didn't really step out of the shadows of the product, almost certainly because it's not ready to show off yet. So, okay, so that what we saw was a prototype, okay, of the Samsung device. Um, check that out later. Um, now that the long-promised technology is ready to cons- consumers to form, it is safe bet that we'll be seeing a number of companies exploring the form factor. There will no doubt be a long uh, by the fact that uh, Google partnered with Samsung to create a version of Android tailored to form factor similar to its embrace of top notch of Android P. Of course, like the 5G, these designs are going to come in a major premium. Once the initial novelty has worn off, the hardest task of all will be convincing consumers they need one in their lives. And that, and I'm not convinced, man. I'm not convinced I'm going to need a foldable phone. I'm not convinced that, you know, I've been, that's what I've been dying for in my repertoire of electronics, that I need something to fold and put in my bag. Because like I said, if I need something foldable, I'm just going to get it in the size of I want it to fit in the things that I have, right? That's that's the main reason why I've got an iPhone. I don't have an iPhone XL or one of the bigger ones. is because for the most part, especially previously, now not, not, now not so much now, but a few, a couple of years ago, I was just, for the most part, I only just wore skinny jeans, right? Now I'm, home, I'm wearing quite a lot of baggy trousers, but if you're wearing skinny jeans all the time, you can't necessarily have a massive phone in your pocket. It's not necessarily that comfortable, especially skin tight jeans. So the most, it's just functionality. I'd carry like a smaller phone. And usually I'm always having books in my bigger pockets. Anyway, I wouldn't necessarily want a book and an electronic thing in there, just too heavy. So the idea that I'd, I'd want a foldable device, just a little bit ludicrous to me because I want, you know, I want stuff that's going to fit into my life. I don't want stuff that I'm going to need to bend and cajole into it. It just doesn't make any sense personally. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to do that, you might as well have a, why not have a foldable laptop? I guess laptops are already foldable, but it just doesn't make any sense. Anyway, it continues to my favorite piece here about the embedded fingerprint um, readers. So uh, the flip side on the race for infinite displays is what to do with the fingerprint reader. Some moved it to the rear. Others like Apple did away with it in favor of face scanning. Of course, for those unable to register a full 3D face scan, that tech is pretty easy to, easy to, easy to spoof. For that reason, fingerprint scanners aren't going away anytime soon. Great to hear. Uh, OnePlus 6T was among the first to bring the in-display fingerprint scanner to the market and it works like a charm. Here's how the tech works, quoting from one write-up from a few months ago. Um, when the screen is locked, a fingerprint icon pops up, showing you where to press. When the finger is in the right spot, the AMOLED display flashes a bright light to capture the scan on the surface from the reflected light. The company says it's, it takes around a third of a second, though in my own testing, that number was closer to one second or sometimes longer as I negotiated my thumb into the right spot. Samsung S10 is expected to bring that technology when it arrives around February time frame, and it, will be, it wouldn't be surprised to see a lot more adventures do it. So at the moment, it's not quite where it should be, right? It takes a little bit too long to do. I say too long because of one second, right? But you know how people are with smartphones. They want things to be done in an instant right so it's taking a little bit longer than what it should be but if they get it right if they kind of perfect this and gonna get it where it needs to be then we're gonna kind of do away with face id because again face id can be spoofed on i've seen pictures i've seen videos of people um buying those really expensive like silicone mask and then being able to kind of you know unlock someone's phone but you know that's a hell of a lot of trouble to go to someone to unlock someone's phone but it can happen don't get me wrong but i think the easy way to do it is really the fingerprint id for the most part um it works better it's it's intuitive it's something that everyone's kind 
kind of comfortable to do for the most part because you're usually always holding your hat, your phone in that fashion anyway. So if you to kind of just press it on there is much good idea. I like the idea that when your screen is locked, the fingerprint icon comes up, so you can just press your finger on top of it, which is great. I'm assuming it's going to be quite difficult to do on the glass screen, but you know, for the most part, in most places that have fingerprint scanners, it usually is kind of like a glassy sort of screen, right? For the most part, I'm assuming. I'm um, interested to see how they develop it. I'm interested to see how Apple do it overall. So that will mean as well that we'll probably see the end of notches and stuff as well and bezels on phones because they're able to do probably like edge to edge display but those are some of the trends that are happening so far in the mobile world or from TechCrunch, you can check that uh, article out um the article is titled uh the top smartphone trends to watch in 2019 from TechCrunch. um again i'll link this in the show notes for those that want to read it fully but there's some good little notes on there for you to kind of like spec out there but i'm happy to see that they're going to bring in fingerprint scanning on a glass screen um what else do i have here Da, da, da. mind your business oh so this is a video that I, might be a good way to kind of close things off there's been a I, I, I think it's no it's no no secret for those that know me that I absolutely love public freak out videos right it's something that I watch consistently every single day there's a great subreddit on the reddit forums called public freak out I recommend you check out where they people post videos of people arguing or getting pissed off about you know the most mundaneness of things but one of the things that really really kind of like captures my imagination that makes me think like people out there some people are just complete psychos is the kind of a social is the kind of a social police right the kind of person that comes out you know the, the, the lady in the in the building block that was questioning the young guy that was coming into the block without the entry key and saying we well, not if he lives there or not asking what number door he's in like just going above and beyond to kind of you know police the area in a random like people that don't mind their business for instance that's the kind of main complaint i have and i guess in this kind of you know social media age we're living in at the moment with cancel culture um it kind of does call for people to give a shit about things they shouldn't give a shit about to get themselves involved in things they shouldn't be getting involved in like case in point the person that um i don't know who started on twitter but somebody found a clip of travis scott talking about um the mike brown situation that happened a couple of years ago and there's a small clip of him in an interview kind of saying um out of context that he thinks that maybe some black people need to take more responsibility to get themselves in when it comes to police brutality blah blah blah, blah. so somebody take took that out, quote, out of context and re-uploaded really it onto instagram into twitter in the hope that it would kind of quote unquote cancel travis scott because you know he's had a one hell of a year he's kind of you know got you know hooked up with one of the kardashians um he's had a baby um, he released one of his best albums. He's had a uh, you know bit, a high grossing tour that's taken him all across the country. He's now supposedly has agreed to do the Super Bowl halftime show, even though most of the hip hop artists have rejected it because of the whole um, Colin Kaepernick uh, protest against police brutality situation and the stance that the NFL took against some of the players that were doing the protest. So it's like. It's, it seems as if there's people out there who take it upon themselves to decide when somebody should be cancelled or not. So it's probably no surprise that the videos that I watch are people doing in public that they get involved in people's businesses because they feel that they have a moral duty to be the kind of bashing of justice, whatever it may be. And this video exemplifies it even more so, right? And it's just, again, it's just a silly video. It's just a silly situation to be in. It makes no sense why this person allowed themselves to be in a situation. It makes no sense why they care. It makes no sense why they're being involved in it. But it goes to show just where we are in a society where we, everyone kind of thinks it's their duty to kind of... Let me let me pause this now. It's their duty to kind of get involved in something that has absolutely nothing to do with them. Now, in this video, there might be some context that's missing from it. But from what we can see, we see a guy in a building somewhere. Um, there's an, And it always, it's always like this. I don't like to say the race thing, but it's always like this. This is just what, the thing that just happens all the time right so there, there's a white guy in the building he sees another black dude in the same building as him but i'm assuming because i think the one with the lady was a bit understandable because you know i think if you see the context of the video uh the dude comes into the building as a lady is coming out and he doesn't get out his fob key he doesn't get out his key to enter into a door he only has his like normal housekeeping i'm assuming because he just moved in new to the building i don't know he might have lost it i don't know what happened so naturally the woman asks, oh do you live here because that happens sometimes in my building sometimes right um if i'm outside and the door waiting for someone to open it they won't open they, they would like stand there and like let me kind of hang out there because they don't know if i live there or not they don't know if i'm just waiting to kind of sneak in there blah blah because those things can happen a lot right um I've, I've heard the stories of people living in building blocks where they have the the bike shed is inside the building behind the coded door and still bikes get jacked from there right people get robbed from buildings and apartment blocks it happens quite regularly so Especially if people like me, I go and chuck the bin out in my 
uh, bin uh, in the building of my flat and I usually leave the door open as I quickly run out and chuck it. Now, if somebody, if a robber um, serendipitously came in at the right time that I was going downstairs, you could easily come in, take a laptop or two and then run out without anyone noticing. So these things can happen. So I understand that. Um, and also some buildings do have signs up there that say no one should be allowed in the building that does have a key to open the door. Now that happens, right? If someone can open the door for you, you shouldn't be allowed to get in. And some concierge, some people have a concierge there that won't allow you either. So I understand the, I, that woman with the guy in, in the building, I kind of got it a little bit because, you know, he kind of slipped in as she was coming out. I kind of get it. But this looks like they're both in the building together and he just happened to walk past them and say, oh, I, I don't recognize you. Do you live here? It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's a building. Do you, do you see everyone that lives here? Like, I, I live in a building that isn't as probably big as some of the buildings in America. It's probably like 10 floors. And, and I don't think all the all the apartments are uh, occupied. I think some of them are quite are empty. But I've probably, just on my floor alone, I've probably seen maybe four people that live on my floor. And I've, I, I assume there's like 20 or so apartments on my floor. I've probably seen four people in the time that I lived here in over five years it's impossible that you're going to see everybody, especially if you're working, right? Um, especially if they're working. You don't know what if they're working shift work, if they're whatever. whatever. It's just, you know, it's not going to happen. Anyway, so this video could, this video starts with them arguing in the hallway and I'll let it kind of uh, go on from there. Uh, so I'm World Star link as well so you can check it out. Hey, what, 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 why you, you call the cops? Why do you why? speak to me like, like a normal guy? What? You don't speak to us like he a lives in this building. So what are you doing no, in my lived, building? You don't, don't live here. He in lives my building. Right Imagine that. In my you building. Don't live what? Here. So I've what? never seen you before. So I've been here 27 years. years. That's great. That's great. I've been here 27 why you, years. Why? That's an argument you always hear someone say. I remember it happened to me a few times. Like, I lived here a hundred years. Like, who gives a fuck how long you lived here? It's not your building. Like, get off your high horse. Go home, man. And again, it's an old it's an older white dude uh, harassing two black guys in a hallway of a building. Even if he's correct, even if there is an issue with these guys in this building, what can he physically do to stop them? That's the issue that I have with it, right? So he might he might have a reason, right? He might have a point that they don't live there. You should tell me where you live. And he's taking a stand. He lives in the building. He, wants, he must make sure it's safe and all that malarkey. But look at the optics. What can this one older white dude do against two black guys that shouldn't be in the building there's nothing you can physically do anyway so if you are suspicious about them you do feel like they haven't they shouldn't be in the building even though it's something that you it's a bit scummy to do go into inside your house keep an eye on them from a distance and if you feel like they have they they've confirmed it with the suspicions call the police but what can you do yourself you can't do anything you're one person you're gonna get yourself injured or get yourself killed for nothing even if they are, if imagine if they were robbers and you confront them, you confront them in that manner, in that place, it's not going to end well for you. It's just, that's the thing I don't understand with these guys. It's just a bizarre way to live. Why are you doing this? Oh, why are you doing this? Yo, oh, you're smooth. Why are you doing this? We live here. King. You're the smooth king. Just don't, don't worry about it. We live here. Oh, now you live here. Like smooth king. Okay. So, what apartment do you live in? Don't worry. About let's it. let's <laughs> let's no. Let's talk about neighbor. Why should, why should, like, again, why should I tell you what apartment I live in, motherfucker? I don't know you. Why should I tell you my apartment where I live in? It doesn't make any, again, these people are so, these people are psychos. Just mind your business. So many things to worry about in life, right? This is the problem I have with people, with some people anyway out there. The ones that complain about their work, the ones that complain about their friends, la, 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 la. there's so many things in life that people complain about that are just the most mundane, trivial of matters, right? Most things that they can change. If it's your friend that you're complaining about, tell them how you feel and then give them a chance to change. If they don't change, cut them off. It's easy. You can move on. You can, have, you can get better. You can get new and better friends in your life. If it's a job that you don't like, raise your grievances up with your manager, um, ask them for more responsibilities, ask them to get off your back, whatever it may be that's pissing you off. If it's a colleague, tell them to chill out with the jokes that you don't like them and then see how it happens and if it doesn't change move and get another job there's things that you can change in your life for the most part there's things that you cannot change about some people some people are shifty looking some people are weird you can't change it can't affect that but you've got loads of things to look at yourself to work at internally that you need to keep an eye on instead of going around policing the neighborhood and you, and, and no one's gonna thank you for it you're only gonna put yourself in harm's way right you're gonna go and you're gonna go and accost somebody on the street who d d doesn't put up with bullshit who isn't gonna be as understanding as these two dudes are and he's gonna be as jokey about it and he's gonna fucking smash your head against the curb right because they just got like a violent temperament about them and you've done that all because you decided to take responsibility upon yourself to police your neighborhood we don't need to we have police for a reason you have a security guard maybe in your building for a reason that's their job it's not your job to go around to put yourself in harm's way in order to make sure people in the building are the ones that they should be if you're suspicious like i said from a distance observe what's going on if you feel if, if you feel like suspicious has been confirmed pick up the phone and call the police oh. 
What do I know, though? This is none of your business. It is my business. This is your business. Do you own this building? I've lived here 27 do you years. Own, do you own this building? As soon as you walked in, you said, who the F are these guys? I heard, heard you. He heard you say it. He heard you say it. He lives here. He lives here. Who the fuck are these guys? Who the fuck are you, man? If you live here, why can't you be a neighbor? He lives here. As a neighbor, I'm not going to respect you. I just, I'm asking. I've never seen you before. You walked through that door and said, who the fuck are these guys? Right, right. Exactly. man lives here. I do it to I do it to white people, too. No, you don't. We heard you at the door. We heard you say it. We heard you say, who the F are these guys? We heard you And I opened the door for you to be nice. Have to so open the door for you, you and you still do that. No, it is my business. Do you own this building? Yes, you damn right I do. You, don't own this you see, you see, yeah. you see what happens. Yeah. So what apartment are you? Where's your MAGA hat at, man? So, <laughs> MAGA hat. Of I, came I, I can be as cool as you, dude. Where's the MAGA hat? What's the cool thing about as well? Is that like a what's and and what's the cool thing about? Is that like a weird dog whistle? Um against like him being black or something is that what it is cool black guy like, I don't know what the cool thing I can be as cool as you what are you talking about dude but anyway the video can goes on and on and on and on and on this guy's been a bit of a hub but yeah like I don't know I don't get it man I don't get people that get involved in people's business especially in America where people can legally carry guns and shit like the threat of violence is fucking high over there um the possibility that you could lose your life over a really petty argument is super high over there um the racial tensions in some areas, some neighborhoods is super high over there. It's just unnecessary trouble. Everyone loses here. The black guys lose because when they argue and they get a bit aggravated or aggressive and they touch him, he calls the police. The white guy loses because when if he's got genuine worry and genuine concerns about his neighborhood, he ends up getting stomped out by two dudes in the hallway. Everyone loses. Everyone loses. No one's a winner here. Everyone needs to just put their egos aside, tuck their dicks back into their trousers and go home. Like, that's all anybody needs to do. Just walk away. Now, even the black dudes are arguing. Walk away. The guy's a fucking weirdo. He's a freak, right? He's arguing with you guys in a fucking tight hallway, telling your other dude that he looks cool and smooth. I don't know why. Um, Just walk away. Step away from the dude. Back away. Annoy him and go somewhere else. That's not worth it. It just isn't worth it. Like, these dudes are absolute psychos, man. Absolute. When, every time I see these videos, just, it never stops to surprise. Especially, especially considering the, the public outcry that happens on the back of this, right? Someone's going to see the video. It's going to get shared virally. They're going to go to, they're going to find out where he works. He's going to get fired. Like, it's just the, it's the, it's the circle. It's going to get publicly shamed, blah, blah, blah. There's so many, the consequences are so grave socially, right? In terms of shaming that you just, I would just allow it for that regard because you know, it's automatically they're going to come after you. They're going to call you hallway and Anthony or whatever. What do they call him on this video? They call him something. What do they call him? Um, uh, white man. Call, okay, they didn't call him anything. But yeah, um, they're going to give him a nickname, right? Huawei Anthony or something like that kind of name. And he's just going to be forever forever remembered as the guy that was taking up two minutes of his life accosting two men in the hallway because he didn't recognize their faces in a building that has umpteen amounts of residents in there. It's just absolutely ridiculous. But what can you do? What can you do? Um, uh, you know what? You, that might be a good place to kind of like give it a bit of a pause because we're up to an hour, aren't we? Actually, you know what? One more. Let's do one more. Brad Pitt looks like his girlfriend. I thought this was quite funny. I saw this little tweet on thing. And some people do this, right? And I, I don't think I did it because you know there's that there's that thing that people say about um people uh, have with their pets, right? Especially with dogs. Like you end up looking like your dog, right? Or you end up, and that usually happens because you end up choosing a dog that most compliments you as opposed to uh you automatically morphing into your dog i'd assume so i'm not sure maybe there are some freaks out there who decide to kind of start dressing up like their dogs but for the most part you do tend to kind of like pick something that m best matches your you know personality or the muna way maybe nowadays everyone's got ugly dogs right i don't know why it's a thing everyone has dogs that people have dogs that can't breathe can't walk properly um everyone has these dogs with fucking that are born they, they purposely get a dog that's breeded with some sort of physical ailment right like can't it's just weird i don't understand that. oh it's so cute no it isn't it looks like somebody smashed it, his face with a fucking frying pan yeah right? and, and sucked out his eyes with a vacuum cleaner that's not cute it's just ugly it just looks bizarre like why would you get a dog why, why would you purposely get a dog that's ugly it's a complete opposite with children right like when, when a kid's butters right for the most part everyone knows when a kid's ugly when a kid's cute it's cute but no one purposely wants to have an ugly baby. So people say, oh, look how cute you are. You're so ugly. No, you, you want a baby to be fucking cute. Like that, you know, everyone wants to pick it up and hold it. Right. And like, oh, and don't over your baby. and want to look after your baby all the time and be happy to babysit because your baby is amazing. No one wants a, well, no one wants a bratty kid. 
But people are essentially doing that with their dogs. But that's another point. But I saw this little tweet someone posted out about Brad Pitt taking on the personality of his girlfriends. I, some, I know some dudes in my school used to do this quite often, but it's not something that I usually did. Um, I usually always kind of stuck with my style of training. And, this, and I always was against... It kind of really rubbed me the wrong, the wrong way. Especially when I used to kind of listen to punk a lot when I was in school or pop punk and that sort of malarkey. Everyone listened to that sort of stuff dressed in a similar sort of way. So when I'd go to a gig, of course I'd stand out, number one, because I'm black. But number two, I'd stand out because I wouldn't wear what those fucking guys are wearing. Right? I'm not going to go in there with fucking studded wristbands and weird jeans and all that sort of like, It just wasn't a vibe I was going to do, right? So, um, and then, so I didn't necessarily like the idea that because you listen to a certain type of music, you look like a certain type of way. Like, you know, the old school hip hop outfit of like a new era that goes over your ears, a really big varsity jacket or leather jacket, Avrex, really big jeans, Timberlands. Like, you have to look a certain way um, in order to kind of let people know that you listen to this type of music, which I don't agree with. So, you put maybe someone like that in most terms to something like this, which I thought was quite funny. Like, Brad Pitt and all his girlfriends, like, ends up looking like them, like, takes on their kind of person. Or they do the opposite to him, I don't know. So you see here the Brad, the man who looks like his girlfriends. So you've got him with Angie and Joe Lee, right? The kind of Matrix kind of looking way, like kind of 90s or early 2000s sort of style, right? Black beat, um, pitch black hair, no facial hair, dark glasses, uh, loads of black and white clothing. you got him with Jennifer Aniston. What would you say that? That's kind of like Ibiza kind of look, right? Sparky hair, loads of highlights there. you got him with, um, I didn't know he went out that. What was that woman? Uh, I forgot her name there. On the left hand side, he's got hair swept up. The hair kind of looks the same with a parting. You've got another picture here with another lady that kind of like a boho look. He's got desert boots, so it looks exactly like her. I guess it's that, that's probably his thing. Got another, is that Gwyneth Paltrow, right? Yeah, another look with Gwyneth Paltrow. He's kind of got similar kind of glasses, similar kind of hairstyle, similar kind of dress code. And then again, Angie and Jolie, he's got a similar kind of look as well when he's with her. So I guess it might just be his thing in general. I'm assuming most women won't, won't care, right? Because it's Brad Pitt don't care if he looks like you and it might be a compliment but it's not necessarily a thing that i'm very fond of in general he's got more pictures of him actually doing it too <laughs> which is nuts uh, again it's not something i've been not something i've ever done thought it was a good idea to kind of like look like my girlfriend's kind of a bit, it's a bit strange i think in general i think going for people that just look like you in general is a bit weird anyway uh like having a mirror image or something like you know some people do like that right like like the girl version of themselves but i think that's a little bit creepy kind of bordering on the incestuous but again that's just brad's thing looking at the pictures now he's had some dimos on his hand though isn't it? he went out with gwyneth paltrow i never, never knew that actually okay he's actually had some dimos on his on his arm though right yeah, yeah there we go brad pitt looks like his girlfriends and that is a perfect place to call it a day this has been the Snow zinga show episode number 135 thank you so much for tuning in it's been an absolute pleasure to have the company of you listeners on this dear old podcast as per usual or as usual this podcast is brought to you by audible to claim one free book credit as well as a 30-day free trial visit a link below in my description audible.com for slash aggie audible.com for slash aggie to read a book on there at the moment i'm reading um i'm doing i'm i'm multitasking right so i'm currently reading uh laws of human nature by robert green in its physical book and i've also got it here as an audio book too this is this is available uh, as well on audible audible so you can check this out i think the forward is uh read by robert green himself the author and the, and the rest is by a narrator but most books are read by the author themselves so it helps to really bring the book to life so i recommend you check that out audible.com for slash i get to claim your one free book credit and a 30-day free trial also visit a link to my website axiozinga.com i've got two more dj sets left for the year one on friday one on saturday friday as always is at tap east so that's from 7 to 11 30 and then saturday i'm going to be at the heathcote and star for lab at Teas from 9 to 1 a.m. That'll be a lot of fun. That'll be kind of the unofficial New Year's Eve party. So I'll be playing a lot of new cool stuff there. A little bit more of an opportunity for me to flex my muscle DJ wise. Tap the charge of town usually play a little bit more of crowd friendly sort of music and a uh, Heathcote star because they've got CDJs. Because I usually play my US, I take my USB sticks because I can kind of practice mixing on there. Practice mixing with the CDJs is I tend to kind of take a bit a few more chances and try and play a little bit more of a professional set, something that I would want to play if I ever got booked in like an X or Y or, or those kind of venues, right? Something on those kind of levels of performance. So if you're willing to go somewhere and not kind of get drawn into the whole rush of New Year's Eve, come down to Heathcote and Star in Leightonstone for a good old night out. More information, you'll be able to find it on my website at electionalzinger.com underneath the DJ gears. You'll be able to see the address and all that malarkey, all that nice stuff. But for now, 
I shall leave you. Um, I'll probably be back again on Friday for another episode just to kind of keep things bubbling on. Or actually, maybe Thursday. Actually, it might be a good idea to do that again. But if I don't see you before then, have a happy new year and a great Christmas coming up. I don't believe in Christmas. I fucking hate it. But for those of you that love it, have a good one. And I'll see you guys again on the other side. Take care. Peace.